We are only live and local program on right now and able to bring you something that nobody else is at this time, and that's a presidential candidate in studio with us, of course, Jackie, Brent, and Jason. And now, Martin O'Malley, thank you for joining us this thank, morning. Thank you, Jackie. Good to be with you. You yeah. know, your schedule, you have called it barnstorming across Iowa. I mean, as far as commitment to this state, you're really showing it off. Talk about some of the events and cities you've seen in this state. Oh, wow. It's like that Johnny Cash song, I've been everywhere, man. I've been in, <laughs> I've been in about, I think yesterday we hit 65 counties in Iowa so far. Wow. And that's the beauty of the Iowa caucuses. I mean, for all of the big money and all of the commercial and airtime that seems to take over our, our politics, the great thing about the Iowa caucuses is that people get to meet each of the presidential candidates if yeah. they choose. And so we're seeing bigger crowds, more people committing to caucus. And it's really the beauty of what you do for the rest of the country here in Iowa is you sort through that stuff and you lift up a new leader. Well, you're the one of uh, the candidates that no matter if there's a snowstorm or not, you're saying I'm going to have <laughs> my meetings, whether one person shows was, up or hundreds. I was in Iowa Falls again yesterday because <laughs> the last time we were there, we were driving through the snow and I said to my able, you know, state director here in Iowa, Jake Oath, who's from Iowa. I, I said, Jake, we're really going to do this day? I mean, it's, it's pouring down snow. You right. can't even see to drive. He says, yeah, we're going to be the only presidential candidate to yeah. do this day. I said, yeah, we're going to see a sum total of about 50 people today. But we saw a lot more people in Iowa Falls yesterday. As we were driving along the road, I had confidence because my guy from Iowa was driving. And I know you folks in Iowa are hardier than Marylanders when it comes to snow. And, you know, the snow's coming down, and but now it's nightfall and snow yeah. blindness, and you can't see the road in front of you. But I'm confident because I have my Iowa guy, right. Jake, driving. And I said, Jake, tell me something with great confidence. I say to him, how is it that you're able to drive in the snow when you can't even see the road? And he turns to me, white knuckled, and says, this is the worst I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst I've ever been. We're all well, going to die. <laughs> So well, we saw more. We saw campaign. more people. We saw more people that day than any other president. But yeah. you know, your, your events are also different. You just played a gig basically at Carl's Bar too. I mean, yeah, we had fun at Carl's. We had. I've been to Carl's a few times, but I've never seen it that packed with human beings. Uh, we had about three hundred. <laughs> we had about three hundred people there, and we and I did a couple songs. So. The the, the uh, presidential candidate showing up at Carl's. The cool factor is very high there, by the way. That's, is it? That's pretty cool. Yeah, oh, that's good. So. I'm just no, doing well, what it's, I do. It's a nice place, but he's saying very cool for them that that you uh, uh, went to their place. But now, when you were thinking about running for president, though. Did you say, look, I'm, I'm going to run as me, I'm going to play music, I'm going to have gigs? I mean, what was it, or did you sit down with a bunch of consultants and they said no, yes, no, or is it just... Is oh, no, we can't yet? afford consultants. We don't, we don't have consultants. consultants. Where? Where? No, no we, don't, we don't do consultants. Now, look, I, I made a decision after listening to people all over the country. I kept hearing two phrases again and again and again, and they are the phrases new leadership and getting things done. And uh, so I offer my candidacy as a perspective and a candidate of a new generation and the only one with the track record of actually pulling people together to get progressive things done, whether it was marriage equality, comprehensive gun safety legislation with a ban on combat assault weapons, or whether it was the DREAM Act. I mean, it's, it's, it's leadership, you know? And, and so I am who I am, and that's what I offer. I've learned how to do a few things very well, among them, bringing people together, finding a consensus, getting things done. Now, if you've heard me play guitar, you know I don't do that very well, but I, <laughs> but I do enjoy doing it. And there's such a, a, a distance between, uh, such a sense of alienation in our nation right now between us and the leaders that we elect. And so music, for me, I find, is a way to break that down. I was going to say, is that your way of bringing everybody together? Because yeah, it I've becomes always, more comfortable if they hear someone just playing a song? Yeah, I've always found that. I mean, when I, was, when I ran for mayor of Baltimore in 1999, it was not because our city was doing well. We had deep divides across divisions of, of race and class and place. But I kept playing music, and I found that music was a great way to bring people together and let us see each other as human beings. You know, speaking of uh, uh, class, Last divisions tonight is the Black and Brown Forum at Drake University you're participating in. Uh, what are the, some of the issues that you folks are going to be discussing tonight? Well, I hope we talk about the, the issues that, uh, uh, that uh, all kind of connect to that great strength we have as a people, and that is our diversity. I mean, a pluribus unum from many different nations and different cultures comes one great country. And so 
I hope we get to talk about immigration reform. I hope mm -hmm. we get to talk about criminal justice reform. There's a growing gap of injustice in our country. It's not only economic. It's also with regard to criminal justice. And we need to, uh, we need to narrow that gap. We need to uh, take actions that allow us to deliver for our kids on that promise of a country where everybody's treated fairly and where there's justice for all and where people, wherever they start, they start, but they're able to work hard and be able to get ahead for themselves and their families. So I've had a lot of experience experience with these issues of uh, uh, economic injustice, social injustice, criminal justice and injustice. And so I hope we talk about these things because I do believe that there's a path forward and I do believe there's a better way forward. And uh, I, I believe that a lot of cities are showing that there are things that we can do that uh, in my own state, for example, uh, we reduce violent crime to 30 year lows. But at the same time, we reduced our incarceration rates to 20 year lows. We started doing more on reentry programs. Uh, in our metro area, we have the second highest number of African American owned businesses of any metro area in the country, second highest median income for African American families. So I think the beauty of our nation is that we take actions to include people more fully in the economic, social, and political life of our country. And so that's what I, I hope we'll talk about at the Brown and Black Forum tonight. Uh, your former city of Baltimore just handed down another indictment in the Freddie Gray case. Uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, these are tough, tough cases, and the state's attorney is the person who we vote for and elect to exercise her judgment in these cases. I've put forward a new agenda for criminal justice that would uh, help all of our police departments improve their openness, their transparency, and their accountability. There are no two issues more painfully intertwined for us as Americans than criminal justice and racial injustice, given our, given our legacy of slavery and the cruelty that comes with our, our history. And so uh, I believe there are things that every department could do to improve training, to improve openness and transparency. For example, we require all local police departments to report their top seven crimes on a regular basis. Uh, we should also require police departments to report their discourtesy, their excessive force, and their use of lethal force. I've learned as a manager and a leader that the things that get measured are the things that get done. And when you create that sort of public uh, accountability, it can reinstill the sort of trust that's absolutely essential in any department. I mean, that's the greatest uh, asset any police officer has on the street is the trust the public has for their police department. In our own state, we also, in my city, we greatly improved uh, our, uh, our outreach and our hiring so that the diversity of our department reflected the diversity of our city. We did 100 reverse integrity stings a year. And when an officer failed one of those integrity stings, we were front and center with it. So there's a number of these, these uh, actions that we should take in every department. And sadly, a lot of departments wait until there's an incident like Freddie Gray uh, to, to go and, and see whether we're doing still the things that were working before. Democratic presidential candidate Martin O'Malley joining us here on Great Day this morning. We have to take a quick break. We'll be right back to talk about more issues and an upcoming birthday you have this month, right? <laughs> oh, wow, already. All right, huh? all right. Coming up next here on Great Day on KCWI. Thank you for returning with us. You're watching Great Day here on KCWI. We have Democratic presidential candidate Martin O'Malley continuing to join us this morning. Thank you so much. Hey, thank uh, you. Okay, so you have a birthday coming up right around the corner. Besides uh, wanting to wish to be the next president of our United States, what are you going to be uh, wishing for this new year? Oh, I, I'm, I'm wishing for a big turnout on caucus night and that the people of Iowa do that <laughs> which they've always done best, which is to sort through all the all the noise and lift up a new leader for our country. That's what I want for my So um, uh, you were on my show, Roski, on politics just about a year ago, and you've, you've been doing appearances and then you became an official candidate. Uh, what have you learned from this process about running for president? That you, What surprised you about running for president? Wow, what has surprised me? Uh, look, there's surprises every day. Uh, I, suppose, um, I suppose one of the things that has surprised me is just how how close we are to accepting the notion that we'll always be this divided politically as a nation. Yeah. Uh, that surprised me because in a very impermanent world where the only thing that's constant is change, a lot of us have taken on the, the attitude that we're always going to have this sort of division in our Congress, that we're not going to be able to come together again as a people and get common sense things done. So that surprised me. I mean, I knew that the cynicism was, was pretty deep, but uh, in many instances, it's, it's deeper than I, than I anticipated. The good news is, though, that as you talk to young people under 30, you don't find that cynicism. And 
someone once said, if you want to know where a country's headed, talk to her young people under 30, because you'll rarely find among them people that deny that climate change is real or who want to bash immigrants or deny rights to gay couples. So, so that tells me that, that our better days are still ahead of us, but we are, uh, the, the times right now are, are pretty cynical. I think, frankly, that there's nothing so divided about our nation's politics that new leadership and a faith in one another can't solve. And that's why I run. Are you surprised at the rhetoric of some of the candidates on the other side in regards to... Oh, that immigrants? piece. Uh, I, I have been very surprised. Uh, the uh, de Democracies become very vulnerable to being turned upon themselves when we're attacked. And having now been attacked in San Bernardino, uh, having still the big economic challenges ahead of us. I mean, I'm very proud of the fact that President Obama has uh, made the decisions he's made that allowed us to create jobs now for 70 months in a row, a string of 70 months in a row of positive job growth. But the majority of us are still earning the same or less than we were 12 years ago. So you combine that with the latest attacks, and it makes us susceptible to the sort of fascist appeals and the sort of prescriptions like let's issue ID cards to people in America based on their faith. And all of us as citizens have to push back against that. In regards to immigration, how do we, how do we balance safety of American citizens and still keep the door open? Well, our parents and grandparents always did before. Uh, let me, uh, I would suggest to you that immigration reform is actually an economic priority for our country. In other words, if we have 11 million people in our nation that are working oftentimes off the books and in the shadow economy, uh, that's a drag on wages. That's why I believe we need to pass immigration reform uh, with a pathway to citizenship for for uh, those folks that are now being exploited oftentimes in the underground economy. I also believe for our nation's own security, especially at a time when you have ISIL advertising for lone wolves and for people to come forward and commit these mass sh shootings, we don't want to create a shadow society within the United States. And if we had a pathway to citizenship, if we had comprehensive immigration reform, we would be able to better target and narrow our prosecutorial efforts to those people who are actually a threat to public safety. So tonight is the Black and Brown Forum, except each of the candidates, you have to appear one at a time so you're not uh, going against the DNC huh. debate things. You've got some strong thoughts on the debate calendar. Yeah, I try not to get angry about this because <laughs> nobody, you know, fear and anger, I don't think are good useful emotions for bringing people together, but it is, uh, it is an undeniable fact that this has been the most undemocratic process the Democratic Party has ever put forward for selecting a presidential candidate. Why do you uh, say that? Because of the limited number of debates, because of the fact that they then schedule them in ways that will hide them from viewers. As you say, you tell them to not have them on a Saturday? You know, a gentleman said to me, well, Governor O'Malley, why on earth are you guys holding your presidential debates right. on Saturdays? Who's behind, deciding this? Who is making this decision? The chair of the Democratic Party. So, so uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz is on my program, and she said the networks, because their network and Republicans <laughs> have it on cable that the networks only give them Saturdays, but cable says <laughs> to get some during the week. You say, but, yeah, you say poppycock. No, no, look, sense. I say poppycock. <laughs> look, the truth of the matter That's is. That's a nice way of putting it. The, just as wealth and power have become very concentrated in our economy, the wealth and power have also become very concentrated in our parties. And parties have a tendency to always circle the wagons around the inevitable front runner. And so there has never been a time where Iowa was told, for example, you're only allowed to have one debate before the caucuses. Mm -hmm. They made the brown, when Debbie Wasserman Schultz told me this, I said, well, Debbie, which of the three of us do you think won't show up at the brown and black forum? I, I call it a debate then. But right. then they had to change it to a forum in order right. to hold it. So uh, the few number of debates, hiding them behind football games on Saturdays, uh, even the last debate, the one that's coming up, is scheduled on uh, Sunday before the Martin Luther King holiday. Right. Mm -hmm. And then a rigged format where 80% of the questions go to the front runners and anybody else is told you have to jump in. But look, I don't make the rules. But I do have the freedom to, uh, to offer my candidacy. And, uh, and the small, tiny clique of people that think they control this world, they can control a lot of things, but they can't control the people of Iowa. And so I'm going county to county to county. And I've seen time and time again that uh, candidates that were in single digits at the end of December, people like John Kerry or Gary Hart or Jimmy Carter, the people of Iowa sorted through, they made their decision, and they lift up a new leader. Then they also did that with Barack Obama. So they can control what they, they control, but they can't control Iowa. Mr. Malley, we appreciate you giving us some of your time hey, this thank morning, you. and you've told us uh, some great uh, topics of discussion. If you could tell everybody one thing that they don't know about you, the person, this morning, what would you tell our viewers at this time? One thing about me, the person, is that um, one thing about, uh, about my, myself that I think people 
I hope will understand is that I have a deep love for this country. I have a talent for bringing people together and getting things done. And I am relentless and persistent in, uh, in, the, in my service to the public. And it's delivered results time and time again. No other candidate on our stage can say that. Final question. Uh, apart from O'Malley's March, favorite Irish rock band? <laughs> oh, favorite Irish rock band? Well, that's easy. I'd have to say you too. That's oh, pretty good. Okay. Pretty solid guess. That's All pretty right. solid. In the Mr. Name O'Malley, of love. if people yeah. I know you're going from county to county and really shaking hands with the people, but if people want more information on where you stand. Ah, thank you. Go you going? on our website, which is martinomalley.com. Go on our website. We're leading with ideas, offering things like hundred percent clean electric grid by twenty fifty, debt free college within the next five years, the ideas that serve, the ideas that build our middle class. So uh, martinomalley.com. There you go. Democratic you, presidential thank candidate you. Martin O'Malley, thank you so much for joining thank us you. on a great day this morning. We'll be right back talking about great events that are happening here in central Iowa. You're stay tuned to KCWI Channel 23.